Another beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, we're going to go to two scriptures here first. The first one will be in Mark 16, 15. And we're going to call this, Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, creature is an interesting word. Mark 16, 15. Mark 16, 15. This is Jesus after he was risen, and uh, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now that's kind of interesting because uh, you think a creature is like, like uh, some sort of creature that crawls around in the jungle, but actually we as human beings are creatures too. But it's also an interesting creature, <coughs> which could be some of the beasts. Now, uh, the next scripture will be Colossians 1.23. Go over to Colossians 1.23. And we're going to look a little bit more about what he said there. Colossians 1.23 If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. <coughs> so at that time... It says the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven, which was preached, so it's in the past, to every creature under heaven. So does that mean we quit going out and preaching? Absolutely not. At that time, it was preached to every creature under heaven. But now we're to keep preaching the gospel, which is Mark 16, 15. Go into the world, preach all the gospel. Now, I'm going to pray about this a little bit before we get going here and... and uh, because, uh, Father, I thank you that we have uh, these words, your pure, perfect words, in, uh, in the King James Bible and the English language, in our hands right now today, placed right here in front of us. And, Father, put a guard on my lips that only your truth will come out in this study. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now, uh, this morning we went out and uh, passed out some tracks, got some tracks to some people, had some interesting discussions, and... And some people got to know a little bit about the Lord this morning, and that's great. Uh, but that's the Holy Ghost's job to convict them and get them saved. That's not our job. Our job is to pass, pass the word out. Jesus instructed us to go into the world and preach the gospel. And of course, you can't stop and talk to every single person you meet and spend an hour with them or even ten minutes. Sometimes you can't even spend two minutes with one single person. So to leave, to leave this little missionary, it stays with them. If they accept it, it stays with them. And the chances are they'll read it. Or someone else in their household will, if they don't throw it out first. But then they'll be accountable. So uh, it has the words in here that convict, convict us of our sins. And uh, it offers forgiveness. Now many pastors today tell us, and I've heard it many times from many pastors, Oh, pass no tracks, it's just in vain. Well, is it in vain if somebody gets saved by one of these? I've got all kinds of testimonies. There's all kinds of testimonies on the internet of people that have read a gospel tract and been saved. And some have ended up very, very, very staunch pastors and, and, and have started churches with, with it. So uh, I don't think we should be saying it's in vain because this will convict them of their sins. And the rest of it's the job of the Holy Ghost. It's his work. So we just give people his words. You can't reach a lot of people in a very short period of time. You, you can't do it. So, so if you're going by a crowd of 100 people, you might get 30, 40 of these out 
might get 50 of them. I think I got 60 of them out this morning. I don't even keep count, really. But uh, some of those people might get saved, and, and we just need to pray that, that the Holy Ghost will convict them and, and save them. So we as, we as believers need to get people the truth. Whether we think they're listening or not, whether we think they're listening or not is irrelevant. What is relevant is that the Holy Ghost, if they open this book and they read the words, they read the words because it's got God's pure words, the same words that we have in front of us right now in the King James Bible. His pure, perfect words are in these, in these chick tracks. Now, there's other tracks that have God's words in them, and that's great. You can use those too. I'm not saying you have to use a trick, chick track, but uh, they also contain many, many passages, you know. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ in here. There's many passages written in these little missionaries that will convict them of their sins and get them saved. So it's not just another religion that we're doing here. You know, We're not presenting another religion. It's the very truth of God himself. It's God's words we have in our hands. We're so fortunate to have his book in front of us today. It's God's words. Anyhow, these chick tracks are little missionaries. So, so don't forget, if you don't have time to talk to someone, pass them a track. And uh, and uh, you'll feel good about it. You know. So now there's always the danger of human and demonic influence because they all have these belief systems that claim to compete with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, they claim to compete with this this book, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's lots of false Bibles that claim to compete with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I expose these people in, in a lot of videos, just as Paul and Jesus did. Paul did it. Jesus did, and as such. All scripture is given by inspiration, inspiration for reproof, correction, instruction. It's instruction of righteousness. So we're not to be afraid to rebuke these people and call them down and, and, and use their names. Because a lot of people don't like the fact that, you know, that, that sometimes we use names of people. But uh, if those people are apostate and they're leading people away from Christ and away from the truth, and most of them are, especially in today's church, they're leading them away from the truth. So don't, don't be ashamed to use somebody's name. There's nothing wrong with it. And if we go to Romans 8, 28... Romans 8, 28. It's our next scripture for today. Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. I'm going to my glasses for this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. So you pass out a track, you can't say it's in vain, because it works works to good. All things work for good to them. So uh, so we, we should get these gospel tracks out as, as 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 much as you can if it's possible. And uh, and how do we know uh, what's going on here? We're going to go back to Genesis three. Most of the sermon is going to be done in Genesis, Genesis three. Now, I preached on Genesis before, but in another context. So we're going to go to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. And then we're going to find some very interesting things here that probably most people in the world, unless they've really been reading their scriptures, have never seen before. Stuff that the Holy Ghost has just revealed to me. Uh, Genesis 3. I think it'd be the beginning of the book. 2, 3. Genesis 3, 1. We'll start at verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to, unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Yea, hath God said. Hmm. Two. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, notice the word tree there, notice the word tree, the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Well, go back and look at what God says in Genesis 2, 
16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest free to eat, but of the tree of knowledge and of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You see, he didn't say don't touch it, he said don't eat it. He added to his word. And that's what churches are doing today, they're adding all these things to God's word. Adding all these extra effects to the churches that are just taking you away from the word. The pastors that are going away from the word are open to all forms of demonic influence. And they're passing that on to the congregation. To the woman, ye shall not surely die. So, now the reason I highlighted the word tree there is because Adam and Eve lived in the garden. They were given bodies. They were given glorified bodies that we're going to get as believers very soon. They were given these glorified bodies. And these glorified bodies, their veins and arteries couldn't have had blood. Because blood just actually degenerates us. Blood is, blood, is, blood is our life right now. We can't live without it. But it is actually degenerating us at the same time. So the, the fluid that they had must have been far, far superior and just fully oxygenative and, and, and a clear liquid. It would be almost like water, a very pure water that was in their veins. And uh, this is why they discovered so quickly that they were naked. Because if we go uh, to Genesis 3, 7, you can turn there next, they, they discovered they were naked because their skin changed color. When they ate of the, the fruit of that tree, it changed the color of their skin too. It put blood in their veins. They were, I, believe they were, I believe they were almost transparent with their glorified bodies. But let's go to Genesis 3, 7 here. 3, 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So how did they know they were naked? Something changed. It was more than just a spiritual thing. Something physically changed in Adam and Eve. Something changed. So Genesis 3.11, if we go down a little further, <clears throat> and this is God speaking, And he said, Who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldn't, that thou shouldest not eat? So God's saying, who told you you were naked? They saw it. They saw it themselves. That's what I believe. And Genesis 3.22, go to Genesis 3.22. And the Lord God said, behold, the man is become one of us. Did everybody read that? And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become... Who's God talking to? Who's God talking to? And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become one of us. He wasn't talking to Adam. He wasn't talking to Eve. Who's he talking to? To know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So God was talking to somebody very important here. And he was worried that they were worried that Adam would get a hold of the fruit of the tree of life and eat it and live forever in his sins. And they didn't want that to happen. They didn't want that to happen. So the Lord God was talking to the Word and the Holy Ghost, the Trinity, these three are one. They were having a discussion about what to do because man ate the fruit they were forbidden to eat. So that's kind of interesting. I've never seen that before, but... Uh, Therefore, the Lord God, uh, verse 23, verse 23 now, Genesis 1, 23. Sorry, Genesis, going to be 3, 1, 323, right, 323. What am I doing, 123? 323. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So in other words, he was sent out of the garden. Out of the, out of the garden. So let's look and see what they might have looked like. Let's, let's look, look and see. Does the scripture tell us what Adam and Eve looked like? I believe it does. does, does it, what they looked like in their glorified bodies before they eat that fruit. And uh, let's go to Genesis 2, 23. Just go back a little bit. Genesis 2, 23. 
And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So there we have it. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Did you see blood? No blood mentioned there. No blood mentioned there. Okay. And then we're going to go to Psalm 68, 13 to get a better picture of what Adam and Eve looked like and what we're going to look like in our glorified bodies too. So we're going to go over to Psalms 68, 68, 13. Boy, we don't want to miss this. Psalm 68, 13. Though ye have lean among the pots, ye shall be as the wings of a dove, covered with silver, and her feathers with yellow gold. This is what we're going to be in our glorified body. This is what Adam and Eve looked like. Did Adam and Eve had wings? Well, it says, as the wings of a dove, covered with silver. Very brilliant wings. Huh. And her feathers with yellow gold. Feathers? We're going to have feathers? Very interesting. A lot of people say angels don't have wings, right? But we know that we're going to become angels. I did studies on that before uh, for anyone that, that, that remembers. Okay. Now we're going to go to Isaiah 68 and see something even more remarkable. Isaiah 68. Isaiah 68. Isaiah 68. Isaiah 68. Isaiah 60, verse 8. Isaiah 60, verse 8. That's amazing. You, you compare scripture with scripture to, to, to get, uh, get indications of, of what things actually were and what they're going to be. Isaiah 68. Who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves through their windows? Who are these that fly as a cloud? So we're going to fly? And it's the doves to their windows. We know doves have wings. And what this actually is referring to, it's in the, the later half of Isaiah, it's concerning to future prophecy. So in the, in the future, things that will be happening in the future. So these, I believe, are two Bible believers. And we'll be going up to the, to the windows of, of, of people, trying to warn them. So uh, Ephesians 5, 3, and we'll get a little bit better idea here. Ephesians 5.30 Ephesians 5.30 30, so. For we are members of His body of His flesh and of His bones No blood mentioned there See? So right now, in the flesh, we're in blood Our new glorified bodies Flesh and bones Flesh and bones now, we're going to study a little bit here about the limit, limited life in blood versus life in water. All the things that God showed us in the scriptures. And if we go all the way back to Genesis 1.20, all the way back to Genesis 1.20. Genesis 1.20. Genesis 1.20. And God said... Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So let the waters bring forth every creature that hath life. Let the waters bring life. And then move over to Genesis 6.17. Let's put everything into context, compare scripture with scripture here. Genesis 6.17. 6.17. And behold, I even, I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life <clears throat> from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. That was breath of life. Flood waters. Destroy everything wherein is the breath of life. John 4, 14, it's the New Testament. Then we're going to get real interesting now. John 4, 14. John 
seven, four, fourteen. But whosoever, okay, God was actually talking to a woman that came to the well in Samaria, and uh, and she uh, wanted to, uh, and she give him a drink of water. Whosoever drinketh, but whosoever drinketh of the of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So all this water stuff, all this water stuff, we're going back into the veins of Adam and Eve. Why, why I think it was water. And uh, then we're going to go to uh, Revelation 21.6. Revelation 21.6. And then after that's Revelation 22. Revelation 21.6. 21.6. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And then Revelation 22, 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, crystal, clear as crystal, Proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb. See, a pure river of water of life. So the life is in the water. And so, uh, and then Revelation twenty two seventeen. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Okay, now I want to just go back to John, the book of John, stay in the New Testament, 738, 738, it's a Bible study, let's study the Bible, John He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Wow. Okay. Now, so many claim uh, in churches, even even people in the world, that, that it, was, it, was, it was an apple that was in the garden. It was a forbidden fruit. But I see something else in the scriptures. I see something else in the scriptures. We're going to go to those scriptures now. I see something else in the scriptures. And... Uh, it also shows us where God's word is, which Bibles are, are, are true, which Bibles are God's words, which Bibles have pure words. And unfortunately, the impure words are in all the new Bible versions, pretty much. There's, there's a couple, a couple of exceptions, and all Dutch Bibles, including the Staten Vertelling 1637. And we're going to go to Isaiah 18 first, Isaiah 18, Isaiah 18. I'm going to look at what that fruit was in the garden. Isaiah 18. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm very, very sure that I believe, I believe this is what the fruit was in the garden. God's showing us this. Everything's in this book. Everything is in this book. Isaiah 18. Isaiah 18. Isaiah 18, 5. 5. Let's take a look at what that fruit. For before the harvest, when the bud is perfect, and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he shall both cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks and take away and cut down the branches. Hmm. Now the interesting thing is that... Uh, in the uh, Dutch Bibles, I'm going to just translate exactly what it says here, and, and uh, 
For before the harvest, when the blemish is complete and the unripe grape becomes ripe after the blossom, the unripe grape becomes ripe, he will cut off the branches with pruning cutters and cut off the branches and cut them off. So they've changed it. The Dutch Bibles have changed it to the unripe grape. And in, the, in God's word, it's, it's the, uh, the sour grape. So in Jeremiah 31, just go over to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, we're going to get, we need a witness scripture. We've got to have witness scriptures if, 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 this is God, if, God, if this is God's truth. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. 29. Jeremiah 31, 29. 29. In those days they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Jeremiah 31. And again, in all the new Bible versions, uh, in the Dutch versions, it says an unripe grape. It's not, they changed, they took out the word sour and, and added the word unripened to there. Now the interesting here, thing here is there was Bibles before the Staten Vertel, like 1637. There was the Delft Bible, 1477. There was the Louvain Bible in 1548. And I'm just going to read from there. Now it's very old Dutch. I'm going to read from there what was in the Bible before they made the Staten Vertel, before they corrupted the Staten Vertel. In the Dachen, in Solen, say, Vorten, Nit mer sechen. Die vaderen hebben een suren druf geëten. En de kinderen tanden ze verbond geworden. Which is translated in English to, In those days they are no longer saying the fathers have a sour grape eaten and the children's teeth are on edge. Perfect. God's, God's perfect words. In a Dutch Bible from 1548. That's God's perfect words. So why did the Staten Vertelling corrupt the scriptures? But the Staten Vertelling, in, uh, in, uh, in, they, they, they completely changed that too. Now, Jeremiah 31, 30. I wanted to show you this in the Louvensa Bible too. This in the Louvensa Bible. It says, Mar een lechelik sal een zijn boostheid sturen al mens die een suren druf geheten die standen sullen Bumik Warden, which I be able to translate to using Google Translate, but all shall surely die. All men who eat the sour grape, that his teeth be on edge. It had the sour grape. It had the sour grape there. And the King James, of course, is, is Jeremiah thirty one thirty. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a perfect word of God in Dutch. That matches the King James Bible in 1548. 1548. Now we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel. Go back to Ezekiel here, just for a minute, and we're going to look at more of the sour grape. We're going to get another witness, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18.2. Ezekiel 18.2. Ezekiel, that's a little bit further than Jeremiah. Ezekiel 18, 2. Ezekiel 18, 2. What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? You see? So it's the fathers. You're talking about the father. Way back. You're talking way back. And I believe they're talking about the garden. Adam and Eve. Yes. The fathers have eaten sour grapes. And the children's teeth. So, what does it mean by the children's teeth set on edge? Has, has anyone thought about that now that we've read that three times with all those witnesses? Well, were Cain and Abel not set on edge? Were they not set on edge against each other? In fact, Cain slew Abel. Cain slew Abel. It set their teeth so far on edge that one brother killed the other. Now, I'm going to give you a third witness here. We're going to go back to Luvensa Babel, Ezekiel 18.2. And let's see what that says. Like it's old Dutch, and I don't know if that's good anyhow, but I'll try. That ge under the leden the perabel kert. In dit 
gemeen sig word en laat dan Israel zeggen de vaderen hebben in zuren droef gegeten en de kinderen tender, tenden worden boemik boom, boomic maybe it's boomic I don't know how to pronounce it and translates English that among those who the proverb concerning Israel say the fathers have the sour grape eaten and the children's teeth set on edge look in 1548, already God's perfect word. Why did this not for telling corrupt them? But let's just look at look at look at what the what the scriptures, what God says about grapes. And we're going to go back to Genesis again, to Genesis 49, Genesis 49:11, Genesis 49:11. This, this is getting exciting here because we're going to find some things about grapes we never saw before. Genesis 49:11, Genesis 49:11. Genesis 49.11 is binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Blood of grapes? Why would they call it the blood of grapes? That's kind of interesting, eh? Scripture with scripture. So it's Genesis 49.11. So then uh, we're going to go to Numbers. Numbers, just a little bit further over. We're going to go to Numbers. Uh, Numbers 6, 3, verse 3, and verse 4. Now we're going to get very interesting about, remember we talked about the tree back in Genesis? Now we're going to find something out here. Very interesting. Numbers 6, 3, and 4. Numbers 6, 3, and 4. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. Now, they're talking about Samson here. Uh, 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 the instruction to Samson's mother that he shouldn't be drinking uh, uh, wine and strong drink. And shall drink no vinegar of wine. Vinegar of wine. Hmm, interesting. Vinegar. I wonder what vinegar of wine is. Or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor. So we've got vinegar. We've got liquor. And we've got wine and strong drink. We've got it all here. Liquor of grapes. Nor eat most moist grapes or dry. So he wasn't eating any grapes at all to pollute his blood. That's where he got all the strength. These are very specific instructions from God. Grapes and anything to do with grapes which make wine and make the strong drink and make the liquors. They use grapes. <clears throat> and then verse 4. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from which the kernels even to the husk. Vine tree. You see, remember back in Genesis? Not eat of any tree of the garden or eat, uh, not eat of the tree of the forbidden fruit. It's a tree. The grape, the vine is called a tree. God just showed us that. Okay. Then we're going to go to Numbers 13, 23. Just a little bit further along here in the same book. Numbers 13, 23. 13, 23. And they came unto the brook of Eshkol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and the figs. It took one cluster of grapes. They had to use a big staff. Just to carry that one cluster of grapes. You know how huge those grapes were? One, one cluster, that's like a handful that you normally eat. It's, it's like the, uh, it looks like uh, the small little tree, you know, that... That, that hangs down in a V. One cluster. It took two men to carry one cluster between a, a staff. Huh. Now Numbers 13, 24. Is the place was called the Brook of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes 
which the children of Israel cut down from me, from, from thence. So actually, Eshkol means a cluster of grapes. So God's actually teaching us all the Hebrew he wants us to know. He's teaching us all the Greek he wants us to know in this book. And I can show you all the places one day. We'll do a study on it. All, all the Greek and Hebrew you need to know, God teaches you. That's all you need to know. No other. Don't listen to any pa other pastors that are retranslating the King James Bible into English and Greek. All the Greek and Hebrew you know is written in this book. And there is Greek and Hebrew written in this book. And God translates that for you right away. He translates it for you. Okay. Deuteronomy 32, 14. Deuteronomy 32, 14. That's uh, the last book of Moses. The last book of Moses. Deuteronomy 32, 14. 32, 14. Butter of kine. By the way, a kine is a cow. That's a butter comes from a cow. Butter of kine and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Basham and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat. And thou dost, didst drink the pure blood of the grape. Wow. The pure blood of the grape. Okay. So, why is it so important to trust this Bible? Why is it so important to trust this book? Does anyone know why it's so important to trust this book and no, no other book that's called the Bible? Uh, we're going to go to uh, John 12, 44 and 45. So we just need to study this just a little bit. John 12, 44 to 35. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 44. Or John 12, 44 to 45. John 12. 44 to 45. Jesus cried out and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. So what is Jesus saying there? You know, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and a lot of people say that Jesus was just a man, he wasn't God. You got to show him the scripture. You got to show him the scripture. See, Jesus cried out and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. In other words, Jesus just told everyone he's God. He just told everyone he's God. So the Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they can't get around that one. Can't get around that one. Now, I want you to compare that scripture to, we're not talking about Jehovah's Witnesses here, but it's just interesting. Compare that scripture to John 14, 8 and 9. Now, just keep your finger there and you can compare it yourself. John 14, 8 and 9. John 14, 14, 8 and 9. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient to us. Remember these scriptures and write them down if, if you're ever having a discussion with the Jehovah's Witness because they won't be able to get it. They'll change the subject right away. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Jesus just said again, he was God. Look at me, I'm God. I'm God manifest in the flesh. Yeah. yeah. So this is John 14 again. Yeah. We compared it to 8 and 9. Now we're going to go to John, back to John 12. 46 to 49, you stole your finger there, right? John 12, it's just right back here. John 12, 46 to 49. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. So if you don't want to believe, don't believe. You're not going to judge you yet. So 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment 
which I should say and what I should speak. And we must read verse 50. And I know this commandment is everlasting. Whosoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So, have you rejected this book? You may, you may, there's people out there that have probably, possibly been saved by, by the NIV and many other Bible versions and, and, and many Dutch Bibles because some of God's words are in there. Yeah, absolutely. You might have been saved because what do you say? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But when you're confronted with this book, this is God's pure, perfect word in English and you reject it. This is what God has for you, what we're reading right now. This, this, is, this, book, this book itself is going to judge you. This book will judge you and, and, at the end. You'll be judged out of it. So have you rejected his words? John 16, 13. Let's see. Everyone knows John, John uh, 16, 3. But let's go to John 16, 13. John 3, 16. We're going to go to John 16, 13. John 16, 13. John 16, 13. Now, this is a very important scripture. This is very, because whether you were saved with an with a NIV, a Staten Vertelling, a, a head book, uh, any Bible, whether you're saved, John 16, 3 is, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So, God gave us a perfect book in English, a final authority. He gave us a perfect book. Why would you trade this book for another vineyard? You know how many churches you go to and say, Oh yeah, but the NIV is easier to read. The NASB is easier to read. All these books are easier to read. Uh, that book is easier to read for Dutch people. Why would you trade your vineyard in for anything less? So God also said, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. So if you're in darkness with another translation, if you're in darkness with another translation, you hate the light because you don't want to give something up. So let's just go and look at that. John, John 3, 19 to 21. John 3, 19 to 20. Because everyone knows John 3, 16, right? Everyone knows John, where John is because John 3, 16, everyone quotes all the time, Christians and non-Christians alike. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Everybody knows that scripture. But look down a little further. John 3, 19 to 21. And we just talked about the darkness and how the book's going to judge you, right? And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So they're doing things they're not supposed to be. People are doing things they're not supposed to be. And so they love the darkness rather than the light. That's why they don't want to come to the light. So for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. So when the words of God are spoken, you hate it. You hate it. Neither cometh to the light Least his deeds should be reproved. So most people that say, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. They don't want their deeds reproved. But they're going to be judged, you know. And then verse uh, uh, 21. But he that doth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So in other words, you, 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 might, still, you might still lie a little bit. You might still sin a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? It's rotten God. It's rotten God. It's right in God. You're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. You believe. This, this book, it convicts you of your sins. This book, it convicts you of your sins. That's why most people want to say, oh, you think your, your God's word is only in the King James Bible. And most people, it convicts you. That they're scared of this book. They're scared of this book or they'd read it. They'd read it. Now, either this book will keep you from your sins or your sins will keep you from this book. It's one of the two. And it's just that simple. This is the pure, perfect Word of God. So, we probably should all be reading it a little bit, but Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. Let's just go there quickly and see how we're saved here. Let's see how we're saved here. Ephesians 2. Of course, the Gospels is 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 to 4, or 1 to 7, I should, but 1 to 4 is good enough. Ephesians, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the Gospel. Death, burial. So, if, if any church you're going to isn't teaching that the death, the resurrection, and the burial of Christ, they have another Gospel. 
Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. 2, 8 to 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's a gift. It's a gift. So you don't have to do any works. You don't have to go get water baptized. You don't have to go speak in tongues. You don't have to do all these things all these churches are telling you. It's a gift. It's a free gift. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to work for salvation. Verse 9, not of works. So you see, you don't have to work for it. Not of works, least any man should boast. What happens to all these guys that do works? They say you've got to speak in tongues. They're all boasting themselves. They're all boasters. They're all boasters. You know? So, if you don't realize that you're a wretched sinner heading straight for hell, if you don't realize that, you know, Jesus said it's finished on the cross. He says it's finished, it's finished. So why are all these churches adding works? Why are they adding works to salvation? It doesn't belong there. We're sealed into the day of redemption. Once you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved, and you've truly come to repentance of your sins, and know you're a wicked sinner, and you can't do it without God, you see, you don't need any works. All you got to do is call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you got to do it before it's too late. Because you don't want to get in an accident tonight. And find out it's too late to call on the Lord Jesus Christ and ask Him for all truth. The Holy Ghost is going to lead you to all truth. And in English, this is all truth. And we have it in German. We have, we know we have some in Dutch in 1548. I, I, I can't read all that old English to prove every word of it. We know we have it in Dutch. And I also have it in Hebrew and Greek. And I also have it in Spanish. So if anyone out there needs a Bible, you know, like... We can give them one. Okay. So, Father God, thank you for letting us study your word today, your pure, perfect words. And I just thank you for this revelation you've given us. And uh, may we use it and give it all to your glory, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So, I learned something. I hope you guys learned something. It's kind of interesting that what the fruit may have been in the garden. into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire.